The vice chair is sitting in uh, totally unprepared today, but we'll get through it. Um, and so I wanted to let you all know that that happened. And the other thing is that Eric Parsons resigned. Um, he said that uh, he's received some additional duties um, on his job, and um, he's got a lot more work. And so in order to do work balance, he's uh, opting to from the committee. Can I add something to that? The, uh, Eric and I exchanged a couple emails and he has some interesting things that uh, to share with the committee. Um, maybe the easiest thing is to just get Tony to uh, send those out to you. I don't think it's anything you need to look at tonight. Did you have a full report? I saw some points. Say it again. Did he have a full report? Oh, I have seen our bullet points. Well, he's, uh, uh, he prepared a, he, he worked on some things for uh, Columbia Police Department looking at uh, calls for service. And that's one of the things he, uh, he commented on. He doesn't have the finished version of that, but he has some observations that I think it's worthwhile that we, that we know. I don't think we have to know that tonight. Probably better we spend our time on something else. Could I suggest maybe we make him part of number six general comments by public that you know on the record? Whatever we want to say in the general comments by public. So, make that. Now, I don't have that with me right now. But I mean, then that can be sent it out. Yeah. Well, I, I printed out the email, but. If we have lots of time left at the end of the meeting, I can summarize some of it. Otherwise, it's probably just as well to, uh, to read it yourself. <clears throat> OK, with that being said, um, the next thing I'd like to remind everybody is that if there's anybody here from the public, that you are not able to get involved in the conversations that we have here um, during our meeting, but that at the end, we will provide you an opportunity 
um, to give some comments, make some suggestions, and things of that nature. So if you would please hold all those responses uh, till the end, we will make sure that we grant you the opportunity um, to do that. I'd also like to make note that we are all talking through a mask today. So if we could please speak a little bit louder so that everyone can hear. I'm a loud talker, it doesn't matter if I have a mask or not. But uh, some people can't, can't hear so, so that we don't have to keep repeating. If you could just kind of give, your, give yourselves a little microphone and, and uh, lift your voices a little bit as we go um, through this meeting. Okay, next we are going to have comments from Chief Jones, and then after that, we'll get as members responses. Well, I'm glad that we're back. Uh, sorry that we took a little bit of a hiatus. Um, obviously, we were hopeful that we would have some recommendations in late June, July, um, and this set us back a ways. Um, a few things have happened, um, and I, I just want to make it clear to the committee that I respect the work that the committee is doing. I want it to continue. Um, there are just some things that I feel like it's important that I went ahead and changed, even though we are looking at data, and when you make changes to operations, sometimes that will impact how data is collected, and I recognize that. Um, I want to apologize up front. Um, hopefully with the people in the room and the talent that we have, we can find a way to still do measurements uh, in spite of those. Um, a couple of things that have changed. Um, when COVID first set on, I tried to limit exposure um, of officers to the public and public to the officers by limiting the type of calls that we responded to. One of the things that I limited was how we were stopping cars and why we were stopping cars. What I asked officers to do, um, and there's a general order I think that Tony probably has a copy of that she can give you, is to limit those stops to hazardous moving violations. And if there's someone that we can articulate through intelligence that is a threat to the community, so the people that we suspect of being involved in shootings or other um, crimes that victimize other people, that they could make those traffic stops even if they weren't hazardous moving violations. That is a pretty significant limitation on the traffic stops that we make. Um, and I felt that that was important um, so that we were still involved in community caretaking and stopping those people who are, you know, speeding past you and uh, taking your doors off when they went by, blowing stop lights, stop signs, things like that. Uh, we still have to address crime, and that's why I left the caveat that there are just some people that we're going to stop um, for investigative reasons sometimes, um, always with reasonable suspicion, but it may be for a tail light. If that's what we have to use to make contact with someone who's shooting at someone else, then that's what we're going to do. As COVID went on, um, we, had a, we had a delay in getting the recommendations from the board, I knew, or the committee. I know that the committee was discussing uh, investigative stops, pretextual stops, um, which I think is healthy. Um, I do think that there is um, disparity that can be found there um, just by the nature of those stops. Um, and because of that delay, I felt it was important uh, to go ahead and extend that order that I had initially given when COVID first started. So through the end of the year, we will only be stopping those hazardous moving violations and people that we can articulate are part of a bigger issue, a threat to the community. In addition to that, uh, I'm going to reach out to some folks in town with the university. I and I'm. I understand that there's reporters in the room, and I don't want to put the university on on the spot. But my intention is to talk to the university and see if there's any possibility in having a study completed by professional researchers at the university um, to help us look at 
those variables that officers consider when they stop cars. And I think that in doing that, we'll find a lot of information that will be worthwhile in policy development. It'll be um, something that would work in conjunction with this committee. Um, and I wanted to see how you all felt about that. Uh, we have people in this room um, and have had others on this committee who are very good at looking at statistics. Um, but I, I think that something more formal needs to be done as far as research so that we can have informed policy development. So if we're going to move forward as a as an agency that we that I think we are being progressive, that we can have informed policy making, informed training, uh, and we can shape the way that we do policing here so that it best serves our community in the fairest and most unbiased way. So those are two things that I wanted to talk about. I know that some of you have questions for me that I may or may not be able to answer. Um, but before I move forward, I'd like some feedback from the committee on those two things. So I'll find the I said the uh, concentrating on serious violations is a good strategy. Officers are most likely to be, uh, well, anytime officers are uh, looking for facts and acting on facts, they're likely to be doing okay. And if they're looking especially for those hazardous violations, they're not likely to be discriminating. I think input from University or professionals is a good idea. We obviously uh, are a bunch of amateurs here and having to uh, speak for uh, the perspective of the community, including police and people vulnerable to discrimination and activists. Uh, but to have some academic eyes look at the problem and give their response is uh, nothing but good. I would say. Um... I think it's good to enlist the resources of the campus. Um, I, I would also caution against like relying too heavily on them, um, because again, I don't, I don't see that they have the connection with the community in the same way. And so, I mean, as long as it's like kind of a two-pronged approach that we're addressing these issues with, I feel far more comfortable with that. I know um, uh, Professor Emilio's report is something that's you know been contentious ever since it was released. And so if there's nothing that's being checked as far as, um, you, you know, I understand if he's not going to publish his findings, he's not going to submit it to peer review, I'd be concerned about just having the clout of, I'm a doctor or PhD or whatever else, and, you know, we came up with this idea and just floating that on the, on the face without having some kind of uh, peer review community. So, so I'm sure that works. two things there. Uh, my, my ask of the university would be that this study would be vetted through whatever processes they would use to validate any study. So there should be those checks and balances in place. Excellent. Um, the second part of that is I was going to ask you what are, you say two prongs, what are the two prongs? I, I get community involvement, but what I said first off is that they would be working in conjunction with this committee. Okay. Is that the second prong that yes. you're speaking of? Okay. Just so that I'm clear. Yeah. Yes, sir. Mid-March. Well, the first order for the traffic stop the stuff would have been mid-March. Right, and we we have some catching up to do. Our RMS system is lacking. Our vendor has not been conforming with the new data collection for um, the Attorney General. We had to get permission to wait um, because of our vendor. So that information is going to be lacking. Um, as a stop gap, and I don't know how effective it will be, I had requested that every traffic stop be documented with either a written warning or a summons. Um, so there is some 
written communication with the driver and there's a written record that's entered into RMS, including the notes from that stop, um, which down the road when we're developing policy would give us a mechanism for accountability. Um, it would also give us some data that we could pull. be done by unit so our street crimes unit could be stopping specific cars for specific reasons they could be stopping cars at the request of the narcotics unit vice narcotics and organized crime um, patrol could be getting that information from one of those two units and be told to watch a certain house they could be getting information independently from residents in the area who are complaining about a drug house for example um, or they may just be building a case on someone who is a shooter or somebody who is a burglar or somebody who robs people and we have information that is actionable. Um, I have, I put the word articulable in there because I think that it is important that officers be able to articulate what that information is when asked and that will be that accountability piece later or at least a mechanism is in place to do that. Do you have any question about that or any insight? No, I was just going to say, I mean, there's there's so many mechanisms that, that we have intelligence that's shared in the department. It could be, you know, shift meeting. It could be, uh, you know, within our beats. I know that uh, with our, our shift notes program, we can actually select. Those. So for example, when I was on patrol, I was working in 80 beat, which is going to be kind of the, the east, southeast, kind of I-70 and 63 south. Well, we can actually go in and, and one of the ways that we can share information is by beat. We can share it with the whole department or we can share it with our other beat officers. It's typically four beat officers per day or per shift, uh, excuse me, four per squad that will work uh, pretty much every day. So that's a way that we share information. If we've got you know, a day shift guy that comes in at 6 a.m. until 4 p.m., and he takes, you know, 10 thefts from motor vehicles in this area. When I come to work at 8 o'clock at night, we've got that, that gap. But I may come in and have a number of communications to say, hey, this neighborhood, this street, this area, this is what we're looking for. We got, you know, there's, there's a, a, a string of, of thefts from vehicles, or whatever it turns out to be. And that's another way that we may communicate. That communication for an eighty beat officer is absolutely relevant because that's where we work. Whereas the guys that work in ten beat on the outside side of town, eh, not that big of a deal for them unless there's any sort of crossing. So that's one thing that I know that we use a lot. Each link in the chain is necessarily the right standard to support the crime problem. Each link should be able to say, well, this is why I thought this was articulable and reasonable, and I passed it on to the next link to the next link. Eventually, lead to the problem too, which is nothing new. But but you, you now have this the ability and are using a system that quantifies it. You know who said what about what when. It's written. It's it can be found again if somebody needs to look at it. Yeah, I mean, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, but that's what I understood. Your right. Your order. It may not. That they can do. It may not always be that concrete because it may be. Four of the five people on a cul-de-sac tell us that there are cars in and out of that house constantly. We look up 
who the person is and narcotics bought drugs from them three months ago. That is actionable intelligence in my mind. And but they're not going to name, you know, the officers aren't going to say, well, Bob Auger told me right. Tony Messina is selling drugs. So it may not be that concrete every time, but they need to be able to say, I talked to four neighbors on the street who are all telling me that this house is selling drugs and I'm trying to stop people coming from that house. We still have a responsibility to keep people safe. And although probably in my delivery, um, that message wasn't conveyed appropriately or was not received in the manner in which I intended, but when Tara gave her presentation, that's why I said investigative stops will not ever completely go away. We still have a responsibility to use that responsibly as a tool, but I don't ever see them completely going away. I don't think that that can effectively happen and, and be able to manage crime the way that we manage crime. I do think that we can be smart about how we use them and do it in a way that is fair and reduces the likelihood that bias will affect the stop. Well, I'm just sick of in the old days when I was a prosecutor, occasionally you'd get, well, because Ben Nelson said so, he was using an age or whatever. Right. For whatever reason. But we, we, we have advanced from, well, that's nice to know, but generally we try to get something besides, well, somebody told me they heard this. And I believe that guy, therefore I act. There's, there's more of a system now. And you wanted them to use the system, that's what I understood. I generally agree with that process that uh, the bias free policing policy says that officers are always to have credible intelligence that they uh, uh, not only can cite, but the policy says that they're to be putting that into reports wherever it's uh, uh, appropriate possible. I understand the complications with that. But, uh, officer, we don't often are sitting down and writing essays every day. This needs to be as easy as possible. Uh, sometimes the details they put in may not satisfy someone else down the line, but at least there's something there that someone can go back and say, well, who is Mel Nelson or whatever. Uh, in most cases, it's likely not to be an issue but if you have an overall situation where you know that in this particular situation there's a disproportion against one group of drivers, uh, you can go back and see, well, let's look at some of, those, uh, some of those incidents and begin to see whether officers are, uh, are able to cite, are indeed citing uh, articulable facts, credible intelligence. And if they are, then they get a gold, gold star if they're not cite if their facts aren't good enough or they're not citing any, then they get coached on improvements. And improvements will, I think, uh, come along as long as the system's uh, I don't see this as a system that's easy to implement. I can see how uh, it would require a lot of changes in the way officers act and supervisors uh, hold them accountable. But it does seem to me it's, it's doable if you keep at it. Well, my for my position is you know not a professional, and it's it's not something that's going to happen immediately. Or uh, it once you put it into place and you are expecting it to be put into practice, there is that period. I hope is a short time period where people are still trying to figure out what that means and how they do business because we are asking people to do business a different way than they have for decades. And uh, I think it's important that we do that, but we also need to be mindful that it's not just gonna, it's not a switch. And my intention in doing this, one, is to keep the public and the police officers safe, two, reduce the likelihood that bias is going to affect how we do traffic stops, and then overall, uh, I think it's important that we are looking at our policies, uh, our training, and how we implement them so that we are policing in an anti-bias, anti-racist way. And the only way to get there is to lay the groundwork. And I think that that's 
what we're starting to do. Um, and I'm not telling you that what I'm doing is the end all be all. I think a lot of work needs to be done by this committee to build upon the foundation that I'm trying to set. But always know that when I come to this meeting, when I come to this committee, I'm not here to, and I know this isn't a popular thing to say, I'm not here to impact a number. I want what we do to be fair. I want it to be um, for the right reasons. I don't want one group singled out over another, and we have to keep our community safe. And if we're doing all of those things, then we're doing what we're, we've set out to do. But this isn't about a number for me. Do I think the number will go down? Absolutely. Um, but it can't be at the expense of other people being victimized or hurt. So whatever we implement has to be a strategy that still combats crime. And from the information I saw on Tara's presentation and others um, over the years, there are strategies that we can employ and some stuff that we can change so that we're still focused on the right people instead of throwing that broader net. As Mike Hester, I'll give him credit, Lieutenant Hester says it's fishing with a spear instead of a net. Um, I think it's a good thing to um, look to the university as a specialist um, on policy building and research and all that. Um, I also do agree with Chad because um, the university and the city is kind of a disconnect. Um, and so I would just, you know, want to make sure that that was taken into consideration. Um, when you're dealing with the research because you're dealing with two different entities it's kind of like big separation there and so what might work on campus may not work off and vice versa so i would be um i would be concerned with that and i also agree with um, limiting the stuff to more hazardous uh stuff because i think that that um with hope going on right now it helps a lot of people be safe um, and, and I would hate for somebody to do a, 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 a stuff under the tail light and end up cold behind something that really wasn't necessary or something that was used um, not as hazardous, let's say, um, as something else. So I would hate for that to happen. I do um, want to note that if anybody's been listening to everything that's going on, um, everything now um, a lot of what is being discussed a lot of the things that they talk about the funding the police department and all those different things um, are things that now that terminology I don't like so don't say that Pam Harden said that you're funding the police department because that's not what I'm saying but um, a lot of the things that we've discussed um, and not just with this committee but before this committee the last committee that I believe that was presented to the city council. A lot of the things that are being discussed across the country, we've already discussed here. Um, I've always said that this city has the ability to uh, be a forerunner, to set the example, to be the state center. Um, we were way ahead of the game, you know, with what they're talking about. We already discussed. Um, having a facility for mental health and a facility for drug addiction. And we have talked about getting a centralized location for this to be able to pull the police department from having to deal with those types of problems. And that has already been discussed. And I believe you have talked to the city council about it. So what I'm saying is we are milestones ahead of what's going on in the world around us. The problem is, is we can do a lot of talking, but we have to get some things implemented. And so my thing is, is that I want to see us move forward and be the progressive city that we are and get some of these things in place so that we can go ahead and set the example that I think we've already started. We just have not, we just have not carried the football across the finish line, okay? Um, we've, we've laid the, the foundation and I think we all are on the same page even with the data, even with what we're looking at. 
we, we talk about the low hanging fruit uh, and things, and I think that we just need to like put the ball on the ground, you know, go to the field mode or something because we we discussed all of this and and then to hear it on TV, you know, the same thing. It's like, well, that's not new to Columbia because we've already we've already laid that out there, but we just have to start making a move. So I'm I'm glad to see that you want to bring the university in and talk about policy building and research and, and getting everything up. I think we need to move it forward and go to that next step because we're 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 already there. We just need to make that move. And I think that I think that it's a a, a great a great start. A great bit of low hanging fruit for us to start with. And so that's kind of around that right now with all of that. Yes. Uh, uh, first or whatever. I'm just going down a list of things that I've been just my own list of things that I think are important. And one of them is using automated pit data stocks from like these bunker years. I take it from what you just said, even if that was occurring in the city, and I'm not sure it actually is. Can you say it louder? I'm sorry. The, the automatic uh, pits from automatic license plate readers, for example. Mm -hmm. You know, the sheriff used them. I don't know if the city ever has used them, but it's my only question is, based on what you just said, I can quit that as a recommendation because under your current policy anyway, I would assume that an automatic hit from an automatic reader on a license plate probably doesn't meet your definition. So. Well, it depends on what it is. If someone says it's a stolen car or that someone's wanted yeah, for I, robbery in that car, yeah, we're going to stop should, the car. I should be more specific. I'm talking about if it just comes back and nothing except that plate's these be reviewed, that sort of stuff. Yeah, it's we, not something you know, An expired tag is, is yeah. not a hazardous moving violation. Yeah. I mean, ALPR is a tool, and we have to evaluate the information and what we're stopping and why we're stopping it. That, that doesn't change. Okay. And, and I just want to reiterate with the university, I'm asking them, I haven't even talked to them yet. You know, I've had some preliminary meetings about other things where I've just broached the subject that we were going to need help. And if the university can't help us, then we'll look for grants or something else to find other opportunities for that research. So I'm just informing the committee that that's something that I'm going to reach out. It's not to take away from what this committee is doing. It's actually to help you move forward. But uh, it's in process. We'll, and, and they may not be able to help, but I'm, I'll give it a go. Eric says that they're having a new person come on top of the spring that has expertise in uh, researching crimes and traffic stops. Okay. But she won't be here immediately. Eric would know a lot of people that are available. And I wonder too, what level of expertise the University of Missouri has. And maybe that there just isn't anybody there that's done the sort of work we would like to. Uh, but it doesn't, it certainly wouldn't hurt to see. I was gonna respond to Pam that uh, a lot of the things that came out in the mayor's uh, task antivirus violence task force, or whatever the exact name was, that Pam served on, are uh, exactly the the, uh, the sorts of changes that uh, everybody's demanding now. And going back to that document that's five years old or, or older, when, it, when the report came out, uh, a lot of that stuff may not have been implemented as well as it could. But it's still, uh, there's been progress towards that, and we keep those things in mind. And I read the basic message there as being there's violence out there. We can't expect officers to, uh, uh, to deal with it without help from the community. We need to deal with the underlying causes. We need to make sure that people have good education, uh, living wage jobs, good health care, mental health care, all these things, if they're uh, implemented well in the community will make the officer's job a lot easier in, uh, in controlling the crime. So if we work with the officers on these things, give them the, the help they need, everybody benefits. I would say, from my perspective, one of the huge missing pieces that I have is, like, I'm not aware of what kind of um, capabilities your systems have. So I know, for example, um, Columbia Public Schools have kind of the, the Tableau platform they use. Very limited, like what they let you actually interact with. 
But do you have a dashboard set up to track like some of these key indicators so you can actually track real time and flag you know, trends that might pop up? I'll let Jerry talk to what the system's capable of. No. No? Because I mean, honestly, like everything about the VSR data is reactionary. And so I think we're kind of grasping at straws if we don't have some kind of insight in terms of like real world like dashboard capabilities to look at. We have the capability, we just haven't been built. Uh, because the city owns Tableau. Right. Um, we just haven't built any of that thing like that. It's not built into our current IMS. Uh, but we can pull the data and run a report. Um, but it's not something that's on a dashboard that's on an angry There's manual stuff as well. Okay. So the council is asking me to try to get monthly data mm -hmm. and that's something that we're going to work toward but there's nothing in place yet okay um our rms system is lacking to i mean that is the kindest thing i can say about our rms system so um so we're going to do the best that we can for so the health department has had to do a price for us and learning how to do real-time statistics on the web right well, there are a couple things at play there in this, for this committee too. You know, the Attorney General has listed what those criteria are for making stops, whether it's investigative or um, a moving traffic violation, whatever it is, and we have those definitions. I, I think that we need to refresh what that means for our officers. I think they generally know, but uh, we need to make sure that that data input is accurate. Uh, because if we have junk going in, we're gonna have junk coming out. Um, so that's one piece. Uh, the other is just the system itself is not where it should be. And Jerry has been asked to figure out how we're gonna do this monthly report because he already struggles to do it even quarterly or whatever. Well, uh, the issue is that our record system doesn't have um, checks whenever the officers enter their stuff in. So getting complete data sets is our biggest issue. Mm -hmm. Pulling the data is not the biggest issue. This system is much better in terms of pulling the data. We get a complete data set. We don't have any uh, checks whenever they get their stuff to make sure it's all in the correct. So I have to go back to them and say, hey, you need to enter this. Or your report needs to get totally downloaded correctly. So you need to re-enter these. So it's chasing all that stuff down. Is the system unfriendly for them? I don't know. I've never entered one. Is the traffic stop profile oh. unfriendly? I'm trying to think the most uh, kind way to put it. It <laughs> can be. Uh, it, it, given that everything's working the way it should, it, it's not bad. Typical uh, profiles that we have to enter uh, into the actual RMS, or into the, the MCT portion. It <clears throat> functionally, it's not bad. Does that kind of answer that? Yeah. A chief showed me the uh, Regis checkoff sheet. Regis is a regional uh, data group out of St. Louis. A lot of St. Louis area agencies use it. And that it seemed pretty good and it has a variety of reports that uh, uh, it generates pretty automatically. I asked the, the chief wanted me to look at some things and uh, he, could, he could do some uh, just basic reports. Uh, just ask somebody to spit it out and there it was for me. But again, I'm not a, I don't have time to study this. I don't have the background. I know what to look for, the, doing the things I would like to have done. But uh, again, someone that's with broader experiences uh, should weigh in on this stuff and not depend on me. With, with our RMS, records manual system, um, we have the ability to do those things. We just don't have that ability. Regis seems to have a, a pretty good presence in St. Louis. It does. They work on grants. I don't know what their product costs. Have you looked at it or considered? I've looked it? at it some. The, the issue with 
going to a new RMS system is that we have at least six months of training, another three months of implementation. We can't be nine months behind on this. The three months have already hurt us that we've been out. Um, we need to make this work, and I agree with what Pam's saying. We we have to start pushing this um, with some sense of urgency because, and I agree with what you said, the, the information that we have from traffic stop data, anything that we do based on that is reactionary, unless we make some meaningful changes knowing that we're gonna be measuring next year's data. And then it's not reactionary anymore. Then we're gonna see what our measurements are and that it will be our the response to what we've changed. But um, right now we are reacting to what that data tells us and we're reacting to incomplete data. Um, and I don't think the data is giving us the entire picture, which is why you have presentations here. And all of those things, I believe, can be measured in some way. Um, some of it is relevant to our conversations now, where other things probably aren't as relevant. And I think someone who is trained and experienced in doing this type of research can help us with that. Um, and I think it can help you all make informed decisions uh, not just with data, but how this community works, how our police department operates, what can change, what needs to change, so that we can start looking at policy development in a way that changes the trend. Uh, but until we have all that information, I think we're just spinning our wheels. So do you, for, I guess, I'm just trying to picture terms of how do you see us proceeding on this? Is there a way to wait for them to do a study Generally speaking, I think at least 60, 90 days is the most quickest possible trade. Yeah, we probably don't know what they're doing. But we're talking about several months. It's not like they're going to start the study and give us the results in the next couple of weeks. Um, what would you have us keep doing in the meantime? If you want us to work in concert, we're not going to have any product to work with for several months. I'd like you to look at whatever. So there, I know that you were working towards some recommendations. I, I think we need to look at, in your recommendations, what variables are you trying to control, right? So this is all about controlling some, some action, some outcome. So what is it are you trying to control? What's the intended outcome? And be able to articulate that. So that when we are working with the university, when they do come in, those are the things that they can help us try to measure so that we can look and see if it's, we can be more informed as to what is going to be the most effective tool. Um, and it may be all of it, I don't know. But I, I really don't want to slow this down anymore. And if, if I can get them on board or somebody else, if they're incapable or unwilling. Um, then that's what we'll have to do. But we'll have to figure out how to pay for it because we have no money. Um, but hopefully we can find some DOJ grants or something else. Yes, ma'am. Now, um, as of right now, for mental health and, and um, drug addiction, um, do we have a facility now? And I guess the reason I'm asking this is because today I was out on the north end of town and I rarely go out there. But they've got what is this, center point, so the center, center point, point. Um, and I, I it was it said something hospital or something. So I looked it up, and it said it was dealing with drug addiction and it was dealing with mental health um, and things like that. So would that be a facility that maybe we could, um, like, if someone called into the police department? I don't know how that works with how the calls go, but as opposed to directing that to an officer, that there would be some contact way to direct, if it was a mental health issue, to that facility. Do you see what I'm saying? I see what you're saying. Um, is there a way to kind of, because we were talking about having a, a, a something similar to that. So is there a way maybe um, that we can work with that facility to tie in to some of that at least for right now, until we came up with what we were going to do on a permanent basis to where we could get started trying to 
inform people to utilize that because like I said, I didn't even know it was there. The building is up and running and I didn't even know it was even on that side of town. Uh, so had I had known, I know quite a few people that needed to go there, but if I had known somebody that needed to go there, then I, I didn't even know that that was available. Um, and so I guess that's kind of where I'm at. So, yeah, so Sigma Point's been there uh, maybe a year, maybe a little more. And it, uh, it, it's kind of a, and I'm not their expert, but they, they have a kind of unique dynamic. They'll take uh, uh, inpatient, they'll you know, uh, have folks that actually stay there, and then they've got you know, they've been referrals. The, the one thing that we've always done is the, the resources that we have through the rail is one thing that we've always been uh, very active with on from the from the line officers from the guys wearing uniforms on the street is if we have a situation where we get to the point where we think that mental health resources are, are there or available um, we at one time and i've been on the road for a while but we actually had uh, information that we would keep in, in our go bags and, and we would hand that stuff out for for the resources that we're all providing so uh, I don't know if you're familiar with, with their yeah. services and what they do. Uh, they've always been uh, very uh, kind to law enforcement. Uh, even at the other agencies I've worked at before, is uh, we've always had a great relationship to be able to uh, pass their information along to people who may not, you know, have had an opportunity to seek any sort of uh, uh, mental health, uh, drug addiction uh, resources. Like that. And I guess what I'm saying is, is like. With, like I didn't know, I'm not sure how many people have not been there already if I've talked about it. I know that it's been there, I just don't go on that side of town that often. But um, with, without us actually knowing that, you know, had I had, had a situation with someone who didn't know, my, my response would have been to call the police department. Whereas I could have said if there was a contact or a person there that dealt with that, I could say, well, this is a mental health thing. Or, uh, a drug addiction thing, and so I can call them. That therefore, that tie on Nigerians as police officers as having to deal with. And I understand that there's some additional violence. That, you know, there are certain things. But I'm saying, for the most part, that would free up your hands from having to deal so, with that. So there's a couple things that you should know about, and we, when community outreach unit was in its old form, it's coming back to that form in the next couple weeks. But we were pushing what was then the Boone County Health Department's resource guide. And now that is online on an app. So you can look those resources up. Second part to that is Burrell has, and I don't know if it's a state or federal grant, Tony might know. Um, but Burrell has partnered with us through a state grant to be community mental health liaisons and what that position does is it interacts with law enforcement and helps make referrals based on the law enforcement contact with mental health calls. So if you have a mental health issue and you are a frequent flyer for us, we will refer you to our community mental health liaison and they will take that over as much as they can. We're still going to respond if you call 911, but they'll start trying to direct you to resources. Um, the problem with that system in the past is that we had a community mental health liaison that was responsible for, I think, nine counties. So you can imagine how many law enforcement agencies are in nine counties. Um, we were not, even though they would help us as much as they could, we were not their only customer. So um, Tony and I really worked with the health department and got a second community mental health liaison that spends about 80% of her time in Boone County with Boone County law enforcement. And we, she even sends us emails every day. She's been cleared to have access to her building so that she's interacting with officers. It's a good partnership. But it is not a co-response model like we have been working towards for the last three years, which I think was you were alluding to. Um, We've been trying to do that for a few years now. It's always been a funding issue, a resource issue. So I think that that has gotten some traction as of late. Um, I don't know what that's going to look like after the budget sessions, but I think there's a strong possibility that we'll have 
some co-responders from the health department, some counselors that can co-respond with us and take over that case management. So instead of responding 20 times or 30 times in a year, we're responding to that person once. Um, that'll take time to work itself out, but I think that we've all been working toward that. I think it'll be helping. But that having those responders, having the social workers available is only one half of this. And that's what you're talking about with resources. We can hook them up with a counselor who's really good at referring them to people. But when you refer someone to a facility that can't get you in for 60 days and you're in crisis, it does no one any good. So there's, there's a real limitation on that right now. I don't know the answer to it. Um, but we're at least working on the first piece. But there's going to have to be some improvement. Under resources also. Like you've been saying that, that you can go online and find that stuff out. I know it's kind of like even dead of course, but um, everybody doesn't have access to that. I understand. Um, because, you know, it needs to be some something somebody can pick up and read, somebody can take a look at somebody can, you know, I know somebody and I can pass it on. Um, online is great. But if anybody's like me, after I look at that for so long, my eyes start getting blurry and everything looks the same and all runs together. So I don't deal with that often. But I know some people that don't even own a computer. Um, and so, you know, when you're dealing with that, you're going to deal with a lot of people that are not um, able to access that. And unfortunately, a lot of times, those are the individuals that need it the most. No, I agree. And so, um, maybe we have to come up with some kind of mechanism to put that out there. Um, to Because um, I'm quite sure if I was to go back to my church and ask how many people, unless the three or four that I know live out in that side of town, most of them probably don't even know that that exists. Um, which, you know. There is a printed version. Mm -hmm. It's a little yellow booklet that they have at the health department. But mm -hmm. that, that communications piece, part of that is we don't know who owns it. Is it the health department? Is it the police? Is it the mental health facilities who are serviced by those providers? Who owns that responsibility to communicate? And that's, that's a problem with communication everywhere is who's responsible for delivering the message and are people ready to receive it? So, uh, yeah, but just as a start, go pick up some of those printed copies and take them to church. You know, they're there. We, we hand them out too. We still hand out the printed version. What else you got for me? Well, my stuff's all internal to your department. Really, yeah. I, I think that's the big thing for me. Uh, do you guys have an organizational structure or an organizational chart available to the public? Yeah, but it's changing okay. with the budget, so wait and then ask me that. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to take a look at that. Um, also on the point of the, um, you're currently using RMS, and this might be something for the um, academia to look at as well, but I, I would like to see like a demonstration of what capabilities it does have, if possible. I don't know if that's something the entire uh, committee would like to see and have showcased, if possible. Um, and third thought was just on, on the topic of Regis, I know you said you're, you know, because of the learning curve and everything going on, and this might not be the right time, but I would recommend picking like one of your departments to field test that on, get them spun up on it and try that. And then from that point, once you have some, work out the kinks, expand that, and over a duration of a year implementation, if it's sufficient to execute plays on this. Yeah, I don't know if it'll be Regis. There's a lot of projects out there. Um, it's also a budgetary issue. Um, RMS systems cost millions of dollars. Regis is not. It's a pretty inexpensive, mm -hmm. but it still has to be able to manage data the way that we need to manage data for our processes here. So um, I don't think now is the right time for us to switch. I mean, we have too much changing right now to change an RMS system. Sure. Matt can tell you what a burden it was just to, and we're still experiencing it, and that was year and a half ago? You started the process three years ago of transition. A year and a half ago, we finally pushed the button. And it's been rough. So 
I liked our own our old green screen record system, and I could fly through that. Um, I know that he hated it. I loved it, but yeah, I, I went through the same thing in my career. I mean, we going green screen, and every iteration, you know, changed. But right. It's. I mean, again, I think that that entry part is, um, you know, almost secondary. It's a matter of like, you know, how, how can you get access to the different tables and to the different, you know, data points and draw them together into something that can actually function and manage by. I think it's the biggest thing that I would be interested in. Okay. Well, I'll see if I can't get a demonstration for you. I'll look into that. Can you reach out to Joe and see if he could do one? If that's what the committee's asking me to do, I should be asking you, Pam. And you, this is something I can see my, on my own time, but is the committee interested in having like a demonstration? I think so. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to know. Well, I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of conflicted on this. I'd like to know a lot more. But on the other hand, I don't want to kind of feel like I should be the one to you know, try to micromanage. But no, none of us should be micromanaging when you do what you can do and we give you advice based on I think our level of expertise. But if we know more, then we can be more helpful. Right. I think it'd be healthy for you to understand what the system's capable of and what it can do. I will tell you that I'm not going to do it for one person. Right. I would do it for a committee, but I can't okay. do a demonstration for RMS for everybody to walk in the door. It's just not feasible. We need to get a new chair I for like the you. data committee. Yeah. And then it could do it. So, Pam, if you or Tony decide that you want that, then make the request. We're going to start looking into it, assuming that's what everybody here would like to see. But I'll wait to hear formally from you if that's what you want, and we'll move from there. <coughs> okay. Um, I do want to say that, you know, right now, especially in light of all that's going on now, um, I think that um, with looking at the the, uh, the data on I guess the racial profiling as we look at it um, being up but 4.63 uh, 5% uh, that's a big concern for me um, and I do uh, think that we need to as a committee get something that we can present that we can actually present to the public to let them know that these issues are being addressed, that, that there's that, that that there is an interest in the fact that um, it's noticed and that we're looking at ways to try to rectify that problem, that we have not um, fully come up with all the answers, but if we can put the cake on the plate then I'm going to stop talking about food. I didn't seem like I'm saying food. I'm hungry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, football game and food. Um, but if we can put something out there, I mean, and and I don't know, an example of if, if, if there's a lot of stops and, and the, the, the thing that uh, African Americans are saying is that oh, we're getting stopped because they're saying that our light is out. Or whatever. I know one time we discussed instead of ticketing, maybe giving a something and sending them somewhere where they can get their life fixed or doing something. But if we had something that we could present to say that, you know, we know that there's issues and we're trying to address these issues, and this is just a start, we know this isn't going to solve it, but let's begin somewhere and then just kind of maybe add to it. Um, as we go along and address things from the variables that we're looking at, I think that it's going to make the community feel better about what we're doing and dealing with the police department. <laughs> I just think that right now it seems like a wheel is turning and people are saying, well, they're talking about it, what's being done, what's being done. And I think, you know, we're, we're just at an age, and we're at that microwave, we're at that age where the people just have to see stuff look fast and in a hurry. Um, and so you gotta, kinda gotta give them a taste of something and I don't think we've done that yet. And so I would like to see the committee get on the same page with one thing, if not something like that, that I gave an example to, but something that we can present out that maybe we can 
put forth and let the public know that this is where we are here. This is what we're presenting. This is what we're trying to do to make a difference. Because what would happen is, once that was put out there, you're going to get comments that you can build on that might implement the next thing that we need to work on, maybe something that we miss in the day. So that's kind of where my head is at. I just don't want to keep spinning a wheel and, 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 and not seeing anything kind of go on. And I guess I'm just listening to what I'm hearing on my end. And people are saying, we, we need to see something. It's been long enough. And you know, the excuse that I could give earlier was, well, we've got COVID, but we're not in COVID. I mean, we're still in COVID, but we're, we're actually meeting again. So I want to be able to say we're doing something. And, and I get that we're three months behind where you wanted to be to make those recommendations. What I would just urge you to do is make the recommendations. That's the first step before we can really inform anybody. We have to have the conversation of how we would implement it, how that would work for us, um, what the outcomes are expected to be, so that we're all on the same page. Exactly. Um, and I guess that's what I'm saying. I'm saying I, I just hope we can get to that point to present that to you all so that we can afford and respect it. Yes. Uh, okay, I'll start. Consent search. Last time I asked this question, I didn't. I got a little bit different answer depending on who answered the question. Okay, yeah, can you talk louder, Bob? Consent start. search. Okay. Uh, is there a consent search policy, and if so, what is it for the Columbia Police Department at this time? So we were having people fill out cards, but I didn't see the point in that creating a document that was going to be lost. It was a hard copy card. Uh, People have to be informed of, and as you know, judge, um, and have to give consent voluntarily. Um, and every contact that we have is taped. So instead of documenting that on a card, we document it in CAD, and he can talk more about that. Um, but it's not something that we do on a card anymore. So the so the, the street version of consent these days is. Officers have to consent anytime, anywhere, just to ask. Is that actually what you believe is the policy, or is consent based on a reason to ask for the consent more than just I can and I feel like this? And they could ask. I've, I've had officers in my career that have asked every single person they've ever stopped for consent. Well, and I've trained it that way, to be honest with you. Right. I think that's how I train. Right. So I don't have a policy that prohibits people from asking for consent. And we have to be very careful in how we look at that for the same reasons I was careful in how I worded my order on hazardous moving violation stops and investigative stops. Um, but I do think that that's something that this committee should be looking at because for a recommendation. A that indicates that's one area where it might be possible to find a, a biased reason for consent. You only ask consent in certain people or in certain situations. And the law doesn't care. Last time I looked at it, we, as long as it's reasonably requested and voluntarily given, you can ask anybody anytime <coughs> for any reason. You don't really have to justify it. But that doesn't mean that should be that that's really the policy of the police department in Columbia, Missouri. Um, so at this point, you would say consent is a tool to be used. And I would say from a committee viewpoint, while it's a tool to be used, you should be able to carefully look at randomly selected cases or however you choose to do it to be a supervisor to make sure that there's not a pattern here of only asking for consent from certain people at certain times. If you understand what I'm saying. I, I would love to hear a recommendation like that, Bob. Well, that would be, I mean, I tried to get to this once before, and if we if it got slightly different, the, uh, Are you saying to look for a pattern in? Uh, well, to me, it's a supervisor's job to know whether you can't really ask the individual officers because they're going to tell you, well, our training says we can ask any time, and of course, I'm not biased. But if, an, if you're randomly selecting consent searches and you notice one officer only searches eight only after 10 o'clock at night, and he's been doing it for three years, okay, maybe that's all legit, but as a supervisor, maybe you should ask a few more questions about that. Well, I, and I'm going to caution you on this. We are not a 30, 40 officer department. We have 190 police officers 
680 police officers and saying that the supervisor's responsibility is to go through and look at every consent search, every traffic stop, is just not going to work. So there has to be some process involved to where we, we do have an internal affairs unit that can look at things like that if there is a process in place. But I do think that it's within the scope of this committee's recommendations to come up with a process or a recommendation as to what to look at. I just haven't seen any of that yet. Okay. If that process could be, uh, well, I understand supervisors, but that, I'm using that as an example. Right. I just, whether it's computer generated or however it happens, right. uh, computers are really good, as I understand it, looking for patterns. And if there's a way to make your computer look for a pattern, maybe that's something that could be considered. I see consent searches as one of the best signs of uh, uh, success in dealing with bias. Five years ago, Black drivers were affected by consent searches at a rate four times that of white drivers in Columbia. For 2019, black drivers were affected by consent searches 15% more than white drivers, which is getting near uh, equity. Uh, there hasn't been a major uh, policy change. The asking for a signed consent or telling officer, the officers telling drivers they have a right to refuse is pretty light in terms of changing policy. But even with that little bit of a change in policy, officers seem to have realized that they really weren't getting any value out of asking for consent the way they were. If all you're doing is asking innocent black people for consent, that doesn't do anything for public safety. So I think they're realizing, I mean, that's about all I can see in it. They're realizing mostly a, a, a good bit on their own that it just doesn't make sense to uh, uh, to use consent searches the way they have. So they're changing the way they're doing it. Hit rates have gone up. Uh, and I see that as being good. There aren't nearly as many incidents that a supervisor would have to go back and look at. So it uh, uh, becomes a lot easier to do that. Uh, you look, uh, I think it's down to something like one consent search a day for, for black drivers. So it becomes something much more manageable than it was. Is that, is that for our data or is that for the entire state? Yeah. For the entire state, white drivers were affected by consent searches at a higher rate than black drivers. So this isn't something that's just happening in Columbia, that's happening statewide. There's still a lot of agencies that have very high disproportions against black drivers and consent searches, but uh, so many of them have uh, uh, gotten to the place where uh, officers are being much more careful about making sure they have credible intelligence before asking a black driver for consent, that the overall rate is low. This is something that I, don't, I see it as proof that officers aren't, aren't set against the sort of uh, uh, direction we want them to go. That uh, they're, they're fine with saying, no, I don't want to be biased. And they're fine with acting on facts. I mean, that's the basic thing that officers uh, start with. Do you have facts to justify what you're doing? And, and that's the basis of the uh, uh, bias-free policing policy, that you can cite credible intelligence for everything you do, and that includes consent searches. So you may have to expand that to, so it's clear that the off officers know that even for a consent search, they have to have, a pre have, have, to have credible intelligence. And if they get used to that idea, and they, and they think to themselves, well, what is my credible intelligence here for asking for consent, then uh, the, uh, the disproportion is going dis to disappear. And not only for consent searches, but for everything else they do because they're professionals and they're willing to learn these things. Or that's the way I see it. What happens, what happens when you consent search? People have to get out of the car, the stop is so long. Most officers do feel the way want them to sit down or move away from the car. They can hold their, their uh, Ability to move around. I mean, it, it's a it's a much more personal kind of stop than the than the just word. Yeah, that's that's why I think it's worth looking at to make sure the consents are based more on actual intelligence than the old way of just well, I just feel like searching for cars in this room. And uh, I think it will take that this way. So uh, go ahead, because I got four things. That I just oh, okay. Want to well, I was going to agree with, with uh, Tom because I wanted to say that 
it is a lot more personal um, because in our American community, when there's stuff, if you ever drive down the road, then you see usually everybody in the car sitting on the side of the road or sitting somewhere, you know, it could be on grass, on the ground, whatever. And I mean, me being African American, if I was stuck, they told me to sit on the road, I have a problem with it. But when we drive by, we do see individuals that are all, everybody in the car is out there sitting on the ground somewhere. Um, and so, you know, that is, it's embarrassing, especially if you're not doing anything or you're the passenger in the car. Um, and and it's, it's a little bit um, and as in my community, that's how we look at it. So therefore, we, we're upset from that. Um, and so I just think that it's something that we need to look into to make sure that it's not, we know that there is an imbalance, but in, in our community, a lot of times we're hearing, we didn't get permission. And so I'm, I'm wondering what is it something that is it something to sign um, when the when it has to be searched or what? Because a lot of times we hear we weren't asked and they just searched the vehicle. Well then they're saying that they weren't asking the officer saying, Yeah, I did. So I mean, how do you know that that really took place? Is there is there something It would be recorded. So if they, if someone feels like a police officer, one, if a police officer lies, they can't be a police officer. So mm -hmm. if a police officer is lying about something like that, but then we, we need to- But we know that ain't true. Yeah, because there's some officers that are not honest. Every, every officer is not an honest officer, or we would not have problems. Let me get back to what I was saying, because okay. I've, if, if we investigate someone and we determine that they have lied, mm -hmm. then they, are, they have very limited value to us in the court system because their testimony will be impeachable from every point forward. Judge, would you agree with that? So the one thing that you can't do as a police officer is lie. We're not talking about surprise birthday parties. We're talking about facts and circumstances surrounding reports and criminal behavior. So if someone is stopped on the side of the road and they are asked to give consent or they're not, and they claim that they are not, then that is something that you should complain to internal affairs about because that consent will be recorded on a body-worn camera. Um, that is our policy. So if, if we're in contact and we're having a citizen contact and an enforcement contact, that camera will be on. So uh, unless there's some failure of the camera, which happens occasionally, but it's rare. Um, so we need to be careful in our messaging also and saying that this happens all the time. That may be what people say, but that doesn't mean that that's accurate. So if those things are happening, then we need to know about it so that we can investigate it. And if it is investigated and they lie, they won't work here anymore. I'm just telling you that straight up because that is my decision. So, and I, I'll let Matt speak to it, I think that Everybody in the police department knows that you're not going to lie and work at the Columbia Police Department. So, uh, do we have officers that might be dishonest? Yeah, it's possible. Have we investigated them and found them to have lied about something? Very unlikely, because they wouldn't be there. They'd be former police officers in this conversation. Yeah, and that's one thing that I can absolutely, being being a patrol cop before we had a lot of the technology that's that's around now, the body cameras, the in car video, cell phones, um, things are different. And, and law enforcement, in, in my eight and a half years, being an a, a, an actual patrol officer, it's completely different. What it was. You know, when I first started, is not the way it is today. It, everything is recorded, and I like it. I personally, uh, you you may find some officers that uh, don't like body cameras. The, the body cameras is probably one of the most invaluable tools that I wear, and it's simply because it's not that I have a fear of doing anything wrong because I like to think I do 
good work and, and the right things. But it's because if there's ever any sort of question as to what we do and why we do, and if there's ever a question as to uh, my articulation of why I might say something, why I might do, uh, 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 do something specifically, well, this is why. And, and if we, uh, if, you know, if we need to, to put that in front of, uh, you know, the internal affairs and in front of the sergeant and all the way to the chief, heck, all the way up to the, the citizen review board, that's why we have those those processes in place. And, uh, and, and, and to, to reiterate what the chief said is, lying and dishonesty is not tolerated in the Columbia Police Department. Uh, I won't give any specific incidents, but I can assure you, we've known each other, had, had a really great relationship. I promise you. If if there is any uh, if there is any question of integrity issues, we do an absolutely amazing job of of looking into it. I can tell you that from from, from my experiences, um, and, and I want to touch on. What we had just a minute ago, and I, I've got our our uh, policy pulled up, and I'm not even gonna mess with these. It's long. So, so anyway, so we, we were talking about just real quick about consent search, and, and you know maybe uh, being able to identify if, if say Officer A does 100 consent searches a month, and Officer B does five consent searches a month. Do we have any sort of bias that's that's involved there? Did I hear you accurately? Uh, depends on what we choose to put. Like I'd say, let's say uh, out of your tender, you just made 75 of those searches of agents, mm -hmm. um, and they're all in the middle of the day, they don't think there's poorly anything, you just don't like doing it. Sure. As opposed to your other guy who are, is arguably acting on intelligence that leads into asking for that. Okay. So, yeah. And all I was going to really say to that is there's every police officer that, that I know has got really good strengths and sometimes they have weaknesses. And, and, and that kind of goes hand in hand. You may have somebody who's really, really good about articulating why they would like to, to search your vehicle and articulate for that to the person. And they say, yes, yeah, there's nothing in there going in. Or you may have the officer that says, hey, can I search your car? Well, no, you can't search your car. Oh, okay. You know what I mean? I guess. So, so I think there's kind of that, there's that give and take that if we're going to look at, we, we really have to, I think, be very gentle when when we take that step into, into looking uh, at, at an individual officer compared to another. Because it's such a subjective matter that, you know, how do we really... Uh, how do we really gauge what is there or what is it? Does, does that make sense? Well, it, it makes sense, but I think what I'm really asking about is the older style way, which I train and believe and still think is actually the law today, you can ask consent any time for any reason. That's, that's the law. Should it be the law here if we're trying to be progressive because of the potential harm of misuse of consent searches? based on race or other protected reasons. Uh, I think we should slide a little bit more toward maybe it's no longer okay to just routinely ask everybody we come in contact with, my detector car, <laughs> you know, I don't have any reason to think there's anything in it, but it's just my policy that I ask all my staff, my detector is my car. Gotcha. That's really what I'm trying to get at. Okay. Uh, judges. Because I, judges have to worry about the voluntariness of the consent. And you guys are the ones that decide whether you even ask the question. Judges don't get to decide that. We get to decide was there a voluntary response to your request. I'm trying to get for purposes of this committee to the why are you requesting that in the first place? So I can give you I can give you an example that would kind of throw a wrench in the research for this. And this was a practice that I did for years, and some people agree with it, and some people don't. But if I had probable cause to search your car or your house or whatever, I would know that, but you wouldn't know that. Right. And what I would do every time that I had probable cause to search 
is I would ask you for consent. And the reason I would do that is when we went to court, it created a second challenge for right. you because you had to overcome the voluntariness of the consent and then you had to overcome, overcome my probable cause. I still think that that's the best practice. And a prosecutor, I would love that. Right. I would, I would think that's a wonderful thing. Well, as a civil liberties person, I would say that's unacceptable. And, and that's the other side of this, is they'd say, well, if you had probable cause, then just go search. The only well, thing I've, I've heard would... that from, you know, from officers and chiefs across the state. And, you know, I can, I can buy it partially, but if there ends up being a racial disparity in the way they're using them, then that puts a whole different slant on it. It's only black drivers that they're, that they're doing the double, doubling up on probable cause and consent. Well, that's unacceptable. But I would ask you to, because I know you did it, and I suspect good experienced officers do it without even realizing they're doing it. But you have in your mind your probable cause. All I'm saying is now in the modern world, you're making some notes as to what that probable cause was. And the fact that you then also ask for consent, or you inventory the car, or there's nine other, I think there used to be nine ways to put the car. Right. If you're using any of the other nine, that's fine. You're allowed to do that. But in your case, you would start with the idea, well, at least I wrote a couple of notes down, and so I did have probable cause to support the consent. Why I asked for it. I'm talking about the guy that just, he hasn't got any of that. He just, he's right. just doing it. There's actually a third reason that is in line with customer service, but is in conflict with what you're telling me. And that is, if I have probable cause and I'm going to search your car, or Pam, I'm gonna search somebody's car and I'm gonna have them sit on the side of the road. And just as a matter of etiquette, trying to be respectful, I ask, hey, I, I smell marijuana in your car. I smell alcohol in your car. I see a bullet in your car and you're a convicted felon. Can I search your car? I may be telling you without telling you that I have probable cause to search your car, but as a matter of being respectful and trying to have cooperation as you move forward in your investigation, you may ask for consent in a way that you're not even really, as a police officer, doing it for the consent. It may just be purely out of respect, and it has an adverse impact. I so, think our role as a committee is simply to talk about these issues and let you guys decide how to actually implement it because there are, there are thousands of ways it could happen on the street. But we'll never be able to write a rule that fixes it. Right, but we do we do need to have some recommendations. Because the fact that we're having this talk could lead to maybe further discussion about all things being equal. We, we, we really don't want people to just spend their whole shift asking for consent to search just for the sake of well, and I think what Don's telling us is they're not, but we need to. And Go ahead. In light of the time, I know the big guys been paying attention to the time, but we really haven't gotten through um, the agenda because, uh, as you can see, Chief, we had a uh, we had the discussions that we have. We had a lot of things that I think we needed to kind of express and, and ask some questions on. And I did want to give you a few more minutes to kind of tie up anything that you might want to tie up. And we do have to allow for uh, a few minutes if we have any public that wants to have anything to say. Um, and I do realize that we did not get through the rest of the agenda um, with the variables and things. And so I would like to. Um, Ask that someone maybe make a motion that we move that and table that till next the next meeting in light of meeting with the chief today to allow you the opportunity to kind of wind up uh, where you are. And then I would like to say that um, I think that where we are headed today is that we are in agreement that we need to form some sort of recommendation based upon the consent, and then we can present that to you all, and you can look through that and see what you think might be something that you could use or what you think if you think that it's not anything that we can take anywhere. But I think that there's a big enough concern that we should maybe um, work towards um, making a recommendation of some sort in respect to that and then letting you all 
do what you do on your end and see what we can get out of it. Yes. I was really hoping we would finish that list of recommendations tonight. But I was watching the clock, and every time I got set to saying, well, let's not forget that other attendant item, the discussion we we're having was so beneficial, I thought, that uh, no, I'd better just, <laughs> we have a chief here, let's talk to the chief. I think we were all there. So I, you know, I, I, I'm disappointed we didn't get to the, uh, the discussion of recommendations on the checkoffs, but maybe it's just as well that we uh, set it off for another month. Well, I wouldn't mind spending another 15 minutes or something, but I doubt it. Well, my wife would not mind. Well, thank you. Well, I think that we have, my understanding was that we had voted and we had to be at a certain time. Is that not? Um, well, it's not a hard and fast rule for uh, reasons of public notice. He'd be exceeding that time that, that was scheduled, but I think um, uh, committees and public entities sometimes need extra time to get through the discussions and resolve issues. I wouldn't mind spending some more time. But I don't want to impose on. Yeah, I just didn't know why. I, okay. I figured there was a rule on it now. Yeah, I'm fine with that as long as you guys will give me 35 seconds so I can hit my other points here. Okay. Do we have to have a motion to extend it, or can we just extend it? Uh, if you could just extend it, okay. We'll stop the clock. Uh, we, uh, are we going to extend it for a certain amount of time, or are we just going to... Well, let's see how it goes. Okay. If we get into something that we just Probably can't agree on... Probably not going to say at midnight. Right, <laughs> if it's easy for us to reach an agreement, then we can get through it <laughs> quite quickly. But okay. not. But then, well, in lieu of that, well, we do want to... Uh, I know that the discussion has been good, and I would, I would like to. I don't know if it would be appropriate for me to make a recommendation or a motion to um, maybe work on a recommendation of that should come from someone else. I'll ask if there are any other member responses. If so, state them briefly now, and otherwise, I'd ask that we move on to the next agenda. Well, we want Matt. Wants to make a couple more points. So, yeah, so the only thing, just to, to really tie up on the, the consent searches on there, uh, I, I just want to remind everybody, and like I said, I didn't get it more, but in, in the policy, when we ask you know, about the consent search, one thing that we have been trained on is as is part of the verbiage, it's not a script, but it's, it's a set of uh, uh, best practice, if you would, is, you know, hey, if, uh, can I take a look at your car? Can I have a consent to search your car? At any time during the course of this consent search, you want me to stop, let me know. And that can be, you know, if they're sitting uh, out, out of earshot for me, then it's my responsibility to make something to make sure there's another officer, and it's technically safe, make sure another officer, if they revoke that consent, that, we, that, that we're going to move on. Um, th there was a, a case came out, uh, I think it was 2018, it was Rodriguez. And it basically talked about the, it was an element of canine searches. And it kind of limited the scope of canine searches to a time element. And uh, it didn't give a, a, a hard number as to, to what's unreasonable, but it really limited the, the, uh, the, the time element needed for, uh, for a search. The, the one thing that uh, uh, Sergeant Jones and, and our canine team has done a great job of is educating the folks that are on patrol about asking more and more for consent without having to uh, rely on any sort of canine element. So if, if and I'm not sure the, the, the state the statistics that are out there for, uh, for, for searches and consent and things of that nature, that may be why we have either an increase or a decrease in the number of consent searches. Uh, I would be on the side of saying that we probably have a lot more consent searches at CBD because that's one thing, and I'll give you an example is, uh, you know, I stop a car and, you know, I've got a strong suspicion to believe that there's narcotics located inside, whether it be from where they came from, who's inside, et cetera, et cetera. One thing that the, the handler is 99% of the time going to ask me is, do you ask consent? Yes or no? Yep, I ask consent. They said no. Well, we, we have to articulate to that handler what our suspicion is and, and, and be able to uh, 
be able to qualify whether or not they feel that, you know, based on this this uh, most recent case law, are, are we outside of the scope? You know, what, what does the time say and what are the other factors that are involved there? So I just, I want to turn that out to kind of keep it, and I saw you jotted it down as uh, U.S. v. Rodriguez. Uh, I want to say it's 20, it's either 17 or 18. I've been a couple of years. Well, if I can't it's, find it, I'll email you. Well, in, in general, if, if an officer has a good reason for doing something, a reason that's strong enough to convince somebody who suspects him of being uh, distracted by racial stereotypes, then he's probably okay. If, if the officer can state a convincing reason for doing what he wants to do, and it could be asking for consent, then I'm generally okay with that. All, all I'm looking for is something that's strong enough to pr preclude the possibility that uh, the officer was being influenced by stereotypes. I think if we get to that point, sure. we will see the disproportions decline and people, vulnerable people will feel a lot better about the way they're being treated. And a little bit of that thought process might be, do I really have to get these guys out, get them on the side, call for backup, do all this stuff? Just, is there a reason I really want to do all that? I mean, that should be a little bit of a statement. Well, let's get to the chat box. Yeah. Thank you for letting me. Well, and thanks for, you know, I, th th this sort of dialogue sure. really helps me put things in perspective. Well, and, and that's what I want is I want, before we invest a lot of time and energy doing this stuff, is what may affect it. So. And before we move on, Chief, do you have anything else that you want to do? Oh, man, I appreciate your work. Um, I'm glad that we're back. Looking forward to whatever recommendations you bring. We'll have more discussions about that, I'm sure. I think that uh, quickly before we move on, I do want to commend the police officers for the work that was done during all of the chaotic that's been going on for the past few weeks because it has been chaotic and um, I've heard good things. And so that, that means a lot um, in the community when you're hearing good things. So, and everybody knows that it was, it's at a time that it wasn't easy and it's still not easy. And so um, that being said, I didn't want to let you know if you're staying or you want to miss the opportunity to let you all know that. You know, everything doesn't come back negative. Um, even though things need to be worked on, you know, there's people notice when things are done. Um, that they can't do anything, so we want to Okay, moving on on the agenda. 